Echo's Box Podcast is not meant to be or claiming to be a good place for therapeutic advice. The host is not a licensed therapist and is not offering any services or advice related to mental health in a professional manner. The content discussed on Echo's Box is commonly highly explicit due to the real nature of expressing honest emotions. While we don't mean to offend anyone, the reality is these discussions might be triggering to many people. Out of respect for all, please do not listen if this content isn't right for you, and forgive us if you have a poor experience. Keep your brain healthy. Hey everyone, welcome back to Echo's Box. You just heard another sneak peek of my song Patron, and it, along with three others, are still in the works. This will probably be the last episode before the whole EP comes out. Uh, I'm totally kidding. You're, you're probably going to get some more sneak peeks. There's a whole marketing strategy behind everything, you know, got to do things right. Uh, so, But realistically, everything is still a work in progress. I, I couldn't be more excited to share stuff, but you can't uh, rush such wonderful greatness, am I right? <laughs> All jokes aside, I do hope that you follow all of my music stuff if you're not already, because uh, big things are coming and you don't want to miss it. So that's It's Jones Music and TikTok Jones Music on uh, Instagram and TikTok respectively, so go go make sure you're following those. Now let's get on to the episode. So this is episode 18, and it's about to be a doozy. So today we're going to talk about emptiness. And I've talked a fair bit about this in past episodes where we've covered things like depression, but I felt like it deserved its own topic, Uh, much like some of the other quote-unquote symptoms of depression in general or my specific depression and what I experienced. This is a a pretty big one. So recently I was talking to both my partner and my therapist about this emotion or lack thereof that is emptiness. In the context of my partner, it was more about trying to describe what experiencing emptiness was like in the confines of my depression, trying to get them to kind of understand or relate in some way, because this is new, and they've not, uh, they don't have this particular shared experience quite the same way, and trying to verbalize that was really weird and interesting. And then in the context of my therapist, it was trying to reiterate and explore why this emotion comes up, which is a common theme in my therapy sessions, and we don't have an answer yet. However, usually what we do is we approach the issue by looking at what factors are in my control and what I can do about those things that might actually help. Before we dive into the more therapy healing side of all that first, uh, I want to start by having the conversation with the audience here of what the hell does it even mean to be empty? Have that, that first conversation, the one that I was having with my partner. And as I describe this, it may be something that is familiar to some of you, but maybe it's foreign to others. So if it resonates with you emotionally, then I just pray these words are useful for you to just take them and use them in order to express this experience to those around you. Um, And if it doesn't resonate with you, I still hope these words are useful for you to understand kind of what this experience is like should you encounter someone that's having this experience as you go through your life. So that's, that's kind of the goal for, our, for this episode, back to kind of our core of share, shared experiences here. So as I go through most of my days, I am often met with fairly antagonistic thoughts, be them like something intrusive or just patterns of self-loathing that I have to work through. Um, doesn't matter kind of what form they come in, they're always there. The key word is almost though, they're, they're almost always there. There are a few days that go by where there's nothing going on at all. No negative thoughts, certainly no positive thoughts, but nothing in between or or, or any of the sort. This, This is the state of being empty. Emptiness, if we go by the dictionary definition, is literally just the state of containing nothing. So when this idea, this abstract feeling, if I dare call it a feeling, of emptiness occurs. When this occurs, that is precisely what it is. It is a state of containing nothing. So imagine for a second, you're in a doctor's office. You're done with the waiting room. They've brought you into one of those patient rooms after they check you in and the nurse asks you all the basic questions. And now you're just kind of sitting there alone. The fluorescent bulbs are buzzing above your head. The room is mostly a stark white color with some gray cabinets and you're sitting on one of those green chair 
bed things or whatever they have for the patients. I don't, I don't know what those are called, but that's where you're at. You're sitting there. Try to try to visualize that. You know you're going to be there at minimum for 15 minutes while you wait, and it, it could be an hour for all you know. But the drone of the light is kind of making you zone out a bit. And suddenly, all the furniture kind of begins to disappear. And there you are, just sitting in blank space, nothingness. The fluorescent bulb buzz is even kind of faint now as it's slowly fading out. So just kind of sit with that visual. Start in the doctor's office and let it all kind of fade out. And really take it in as best as you can. Once everything fades, really picture that blank space. This, this is empty. This is nothing. It's a void. You can change the colors if you'd like, but the color doesn't really change the state of empty. It's, it's just a distraction. Now, ask yourself, how does empty make you feel? How does being in this space make you feel? Calm, perhaps? Stoic, even? Or maybe it's uncomfortable. Maybe it's eerie. No matter what you feel, the reality is there's nothing there. It's empty. To me, being empty when I choose to be is actually a positive experience. This is sort of the emptiness uh, in the brain that's often kind of the initial starting point of a deeper meditation experience. When I meditate, I want things to go blank. I want there to be nothing so I can choose where to direct my focus with great precision. However, that sort of emptiness is not quite the same as what I'm describing on my day to day. So what I feel as I experience emptiness in day to day life is more on the latter side. It's not calming. It's not peaceful. It actually fills me with great discomfort. But why is that? If it's the same thing, why, why can I get calmness and peace and direction from one and then discomfort from the other? Well, that's because emptiness creates space in the mind. While this isn't inherently a bad thing, when it comes to living with a mental health issue, that space leaves room for negativity that's almost inevitable. So in the moments where my mind is still, I'm actually filled with discomfort because this is also where my mind is most vulnerable to itself. Unfortunately, major depressive disorder in many cases means that you rarely, if ever, feel positive emotions. In my case, it's almost never. I get small tastes, uh, which is kind of how I know if I genuinely like something or not, but it never sticks. It's never actualized or validated fully since those emotions don't have time to develop. And I've, I've talked about it before, like how if I were to fall in love or feel joy or be excited, that I would know I felt those things in perpetuity because I get a taste of it. I, I actually do know and understand how I feel in a positive perspective, but my brain otherwise will exile them completely and not allow those feelings to linger. So I don't get to enjoy them and experience them even if I get a taste of them, even if I quote unquote feel them. I don't really get to experience those positive emotions. That That is depression. That's the monster. It's the brain fighting itself and winning in negative ways. So when all the thoughts clear and I sit empty, Rather than feel at peace like I would during meditation, I feel uncomfortable because of all the space. All that room in my mind is now a playground for those expected negative thoughts to now come through because I'm, I'm ready for them. I know they're coming. They're inevitable because of how my brain is functioning. So you might be thinking, well, why not just let the negative thoughts not come in? Or why not respond how you would when you're meditating? And my response to, for, to that would be, well, you, you think I haven't tried? <laughs> so, yeah, um, especially using the meditation tactic. But here's the thing about when the mind is at war with itself. You are in control, but you're in control in a negative way. You will self-sabotage to win which means you will often remove the defensives that you put in place on purpose just to shoot yourself in the foot metaphorically. So yeah, the, the meditation tricks actually do work sometimes. That's, that's what they're for. They're pretty damn effective. But 
in the context of a day-to-day mind, when I'm not in a chosen meditative state where that is not my focus, I'm just going about my day, um, it, it doesn't work its best. That Those techniques work their best with focus. And with focus, it resets you back to that default empty state. Without focus, well, and then from there, you can kind of respond and control things how you want to. Without that focus, it still resets you back to empty, but the cycle of having the uncomfortable and negative prep, waiting for those thoughts, that whole cycle repeats. So you can use those techniques and keep resetting back to empty, but in this context, it just resets you back to an empty that's uncomfortable. And so you've dismissed whatever thoughts were coming in, you've used the tactic, you've bought yourself time basically, but it's it's more like a loop. Um, and, and that's how it works, at least for me. Now. Eventually, all the negative thoughts do fade, and you are empty again. But once you've gone through the whole rigmarole of of dealing with negative thoughts and processing things and letting that fill your space, and you become empty again after it all fades and you're done dealing with it, or and honestly, that could take time. You could be looping on it for God knows how long. It could be hours, could be minutes, could be days. Um, so it's it's not it's it's a very complicated kind of state to be in, but. Eventually, they always do fade, and you will be empty again. But now, when you're empty again, you're empty and tired, and you just want to let it all go. You don't want to sit in discomfort anymore. You just want to feel something positive for a change. And it is ever so frustrating because all you ever feel is pain or nothing at all. Again, this is emptiness. When I say, I feel empty, this state of constant turmoil is what I'm actually describing, this loop. It's not the negative emotions. It's not just the emptiness space. When I feel empty as an emotion, if I'm calling it that, it's the whole of all I'm describing. It's it's this loop, this cycle, this imbalance, this, this void of space then filled with negative thoughts, then dismissing them and being empty again, this whole cycle. That's what I mean by I feel empty. It's, it's just tons of turmoil and in some ways I'd actually rather be stuck in a negative thought loop because at least that has some expected details that come with it like knowing that it is negative to begin with that knowing I can respond to negative thoughts based on what they are because how do you respond to nothing you can only respond to nothing with nothing or something (laughs) Responding with something is where things get interesting. One of the things that I do to cope is to refrain from being idle. But this is where things like insomnia or maybe overworking out or overutilizing my energy physically or mentally in any capacity comes into play. I will overextend myself to distract from feeling empty. So that way it fills up the emptiness and that way all the negative shit just can't get in. If I, if I choose to fill it up and all that space is filled, nothing else can get in, right? And that does work until there's nothing else for you to take action on. And of course, those distractions come with their own negative consequences over time. Sure, productivity can be good, say knocking out a few chores here or there or getting a project done, but the context of why that you're that you're doing things the the whole reason behind what you're doing can be problematic and even make you drained or exhausted to the point where you are just mentally empty again but also physically empty as well you know i use overworking out as an example that's come to my attention uh, a lot recently with a lot of different careers i follow that overworking out is actually a form of self-harm um, people like me who are also struggling with uh, an eating disorder or body dysmorphia, that can be a very dangerous negative thing. And I use overworking out to cope with emptiness as well. And that's that's a great example of something that's not healthy to do as a distraction. Even though it, it technically works, there's only so much your body can physically take before it really becomes harmful. So you're not just going to leave yourself mentally drained and empty, but also physically empty doing certain things like that. Um, but we'll talk about some positive uh, uh, reflections on that as well as we as we move forward. And here's where we're actually gonna start flipping that conversation. So let's loop back around to the conversations that I have with my therapist. When we discuss emptiness, we start 
by looking at circumstances for why I might be feeling empty. Is there an external catalyst, for example? If so, what is it? So a good example is this week, my car is in the shop and that's been bugging me a lot because I lack my normal freedom to get around. Now, this is not the first time we've had car issues on the show. Our old listeners will know how frustrating that can be for me. So go back and listen to older episodes if you want some some other stories. But um, I know that because of that, this week, a lot of negative energy is coming from the fact that I feel like I can't operate normally. My gym schedule is off. Seeing people in person is difficult. Going to events is impossible without a friend that I can bum a ride off of and hope that they're coming with me. Um, So at least when I feel empty and negative thoughts do pour in through this week, I can now understand and have a practical catalyst that is being used as fuel, and that is what is weaponizing those negative emotions. So I know it's it's likely going to be related to the car, even if it's not, oh, I'm stressed out about the car, because I'm actually not stressed out about the car. I'm more upset about the things that I can't do by lacking a car, and those are the things that will be fuel to the fire, so to speak. So because I know that, though, when I get hit with those negative thoughts, I can actually analyze them and know why they are happening. And this is a powerful tool for reducing the heaviness that is felt from being uncomfortable while feeling empty. It's also just a good tool for combating the negative thoughts as they come in. It's more or less just being prepared for the fight that your brain is going to try to start. Um, So like I know when when I'm feeling empty and I'm dreading a thought coming in, now that I know what the catalyst is, I can be like, okay, I'm not going to feel as heavy about thoughts coming in because it's not, I'm not likely going to be blindsided. I still could be something completely random can pop up, but as long as I'm expecting something that gives me more of a fighting chance, because say the, the thing that I'm expecting comes in, then I wasn't that stressed about it going in. And then now that's here, I kind of know how to deal with it. So it, it's powerful. It doesn't make it less painful necessarily. It doesn't make it, where the problem goes away, but you can deal with it head on and a little bit more uh, with a little bit more confidence, a little bit more preparation, right? Um, so it can help quite a bit, but you'll notice that it doesn't address the emptiness. We're not talking about where the emptiness came from. We're talking about where a negative thought came from. So where does the emptiness come from and how do we stop from feeling empty? Well, That one, I have not figured out yet, (laughs) at least not entirely. Where it comes from, that part, I have no idea. No fucking clue. I have no idea where the emptiness comes from because it is nothing. That's so abstract. Even if you look at it philosophically, it's like, oh, does the chicken or the egg? Who fucking knows? Who fucking cares? But it's there. Uh, I mean, I do care. It would be nice to be able to kind of find a root cause because you don't just feel nothing for no reason. I imagine in a perfect world, if I felt happy, if I felt positive emotions, uh, those would fill that void. I would be able to more naturally balance between positive and negative emotions and always have something filling me up to some degree, I guess. That, that's my theory, but I, I really have not a clue. So it could be a chemical imbalance thing. Maybe it's a trauma response, choosing to feel nothing instead of something. Um, it, it could be any number of things how to stop feeling empty however now that that does have a small sliver of light that i can provide so distractions like i mentioned before are a good way out and distractions have been my only clear relief to this emotional or lack thereof emotion state Um, however like i described distractions can quickly become unhealthy so how do you distract in healthy ways well One of the things that my therapist and I have worked on is to try and set up distractions ahead of time. This is also known as making plans, (laughs) but really this can be anything as long as it's, it's meeting the criteria of one, being a healthy activity and two, being an activity that is meant to intentionally evoke a positive emotion. So think of things you like to do friends you like to be around, maybe places you like to be, and then intentionally make time to do those sorts of things throughout your week consistently. Not only does this give you something to distract that isn't destructive, but also it gives you something to look forward to, which in and of itself can be a useful positive situation to kind of help stimulate uh, your brain to have some 
some sort of excitement. Looking forward to something positive can make us excited and therefore be a positive distraction in and of itself. Now, there is a flaw with this. I won't pretend like this little trick solves every problem perfectly. It doesn't. But take my current state. I'm often trapped at home without my car. My routine is ruined temporarily and my plans uh, that I would want to make to evoke those positive emotions or at least create an environment to potentially evoke those positive uh, emotions and situations. That All those plans are out the window now. So now there's a lot more time to just feel and be empty and all of the negative junk that comes with being in that headspace, there's just a lot more time for it. So all I can really do now is do my best to brainstorm activities and ideas that will keep me occupied from being in a state uh, of being stranded. Uh, So to me, this means playing with my dogs, knocking out some basic chores, working on my podcast, for example, that's what I'm doing now, meditating and practicing ceremonial magic, reading, playing the new Sonic game. Uh, I have all of those kinds of things, but I have to make them last until I can resume what my brain perceives as a normal state with my car and such, the normal things that I might be able to do. So all the activities that I currently have at my disposal of being kind of stranded uh, have a time duration. They all have a time line or a time limit on how long it takes to complete and a limited number of times that they can be completed with the exception of meditation and magic. So, for example, chores... They have a 15 to an hour long time frame, depending on what the chore is. And once it's done, it's done. Now, there are repeatable chores like dishes or washing your clothes and stuff. But again, a lot of those things do become very passive at, at some point in the process, and they don't take very long to do. So it doesn't sound like I'm trying to fill up a whole day, like a day at a time, taking things a day at a time, right? So if I just like look at a single day, I have to get through those 24 hours. And 15 minutes of 24 hours isn't a whole lot. So playing with my dogs i can play with them for a couple of hours throughout the day if i if i want to over overdo it and and really give them a ton of exercise and play with them and stuff but even then it's probably like an hour or two at a time if i'm really going hard and playing with them but most of the time echo just wants me to throw the ball for like 15 minutes and then he's done right and luna luna's all over the place (laughs) um so yeah, just to really hammer home that it's limited. I'm running on limited resources for what I can do that are healthy distractions. Um, so the exception there being meditation and magic. So what I do know is that at least if I ever hit rock bottom, and this has happened before, I've been through this and this was true, I know I can rely on this. I know I can always go back to all my spiritual bullshit and I can do that for hours and hours on end. And that is how I personally choose to respond when I have no other way to respond. When I have nothing else, that is my anchor. And having an anchor like that does bring me some peace to know that I will be okay. Even in the worst case, I'll be okay. I have something to kind of fall back on that'll get me through it. So what I do suggest is that you find something that will anchor you similarly. It doesn't have to be spiritual hippie to be bullshit. Anything that is a consistent anchor that is positive that you can do for hours and hours and hours on end, even if it gets old, as long as it's repeatable and you can fall back to it, that is something that's good to have. The downside is that uh, it won't make the problem go away. (laughs) An anchor isn't a cure, but it is safety. It is reassurance that your mental state will improve at some point from being empty back to what it should be. And it's okay if that takes hours or days. The anchor reminds you that you'll survive through it. It's just going to be uncomfortable for some time as you get through it. Emptiness is complex. But know that it's okay to feel that way. It doesn't mean you're on a, that, that you're an emotionless wreck. It doesn't mean that you're just a vessel for only negative thoughts. What it means is you are empty and your brain is done. And the rest of, of what happens from there are natural consequences of having a brain that is, quote unquote, filled with open, with open space. You're filled with open space. And you're not well 
and you're not focused enough to control that empty space. And it really is okay to feel empty. Don't let it consume you, at least. Uh, if you do, you'll become emotionally unavailable or avoidant. Uh, emptiness can evolve negatively if you choose to respond negatively. Remember, it's an empty void. You choose how to respond and how that space gets filled. So if you just get frustrated and detached, then emptiness no longer is nothing. It is now detachment. If you get sad, it becomes sadness. Likewise, if you were able to be happy or excited, it would become that. Uh, but of course, in this context, we are not talking about dealing uh, with a typical brain. We're talking about dealing with depression brain. So while that outcome of being able to fill it with positive emotions is great, uh, it's not expected uh, because this is a depression headspace we're talking about. That wouldn't be the likely outcome. I know it's not for me, but it is okay. Just keep those things in mind because ultimately you are in control of how you respond, but I know it's just not as simple as saying, I'm going to be happy today. Because if it was, uh wouldn't be having this issue at all. This wouldn't be something to discuss. I would just do that, right? <laughs> it would be so much simpler. But hopefully this has been something that was digestible um, as far as understanding how it feels to be empty and what the connotations for that are inside of something like major depressive disorder. And becoming okay with emptiness takes practice. And meditation is a powerful tool for doing that intentionally. But that is in the context of meditation. You can practice becoming comfortable with being empty and uh, outside of that context, though, I have uh, no clue <laughs> on how to just be comfortable being empty. Um, I can't say I have no clue. I do have a rough idea. Those same tools are are translatable in a lot of ways. But uh, all that to say is once I figure out how to be totally comfortable in the context outside of meditation, I will be the first to let you know. Uh, right now, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, hopefully uh, some of that was helpful just to walk through that experience with me and and get some kind of food for thought. That's it for this episode, though. It might be the last one for this year, so we'll see. Uh, maybe if I have time for another one before the new year, uh, I will put that out. But um, if it's not, for some reason, I hope you all have some happy holidays and a wonderful new year. And as always, check out echoesbox.com to contact us with questions or requests. Check out other episodes there. Grab our social media. And of course, you can snag a copy of my book, Fundamental Magic, from the website as well. So... Yeah, that's, that's all I have to plug. I think I've plugged everything. Music, website, book, yeah, t- typical run-the-mill stuff. Uh, so yeah, just uh, take it easy out there, everyone. See you.